Good afternoon. Welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens, a weekly webinar series on gardening and related topics. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Cindy Brown. I'm Smithsonian Gardens Manager of Education and Collections. A bit of housekeeping today. Please place your questions in the chat box. We will follow along and ask our presenter the questions after the presentation. In addition, we will post this webinar on our website, gardens.si.edu next Wednesday, as it indicates in the chat box presently. We will also provide answers to the chat box on the Smithsonian Gardens blog at the same time. So let's get on with the presentation. Today's presentation is top 20 native shrubs for sun and shade. Our presenter today is Alex Denker. Alex is a horticulturist at Smithsonian Gardens who specializes in native plants. So Alex, please tell us all about native plants and why we should plant them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. It's a great, great opportunity for me to be here. Very exciting. One of my favorite topics is uh, native plants and gardening in general. Um, so today's presentation is really just a brief overview of these uh, 20 shrubs. I had to pick these 20 shrubs somewhat arbitrarily. Um, it's actually gonna be 25 uh, species from uh, 20 different genera. So the topic, the title's a little bit off, but that's okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to do before we got going is to find uh, a native plant. Uh, it's often misunderstood. A, plant, a native plant list often vary depending on your geographic location. Uh, whoever compiled the list, where, wherever he or she is in the United States, that kind of thing. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, um, they are uh, found growing naturally in an area. Um, and uh, for, our, for the purposes of this talk, it, basically everything uh, east of the Mississippi, uh, and it's probably as far north as maybe New York State and maybe South Carolina, Georgia. Um, I would strongly recommend going to your master gardener, native plant society. Most of your university have great extension services, that kind of thing. There's, and of course, Facebook and all those kind of uh, venues. There's lots of things out, lots of information out there. Um, and all these organizations and groups are, have tons of information and they're all pretty much happy to help you with any questions you might have. I wanted to also get out from this is, is I don't want people to think, well, it's native plants. Maybe I'll have all these other great qualities for it, but they're not as beautiful. And that is something that's totally false. Native plants are going to be just as beautiful as any other plant you might find anywhere else in the world. We're very, very lucky here in North America. We've got so many things to choose from. And um, it, it, it's just colors, shape, size, leaf, leaf color. And just think how much great it does for the birds, the bees, the butterflies, and so forth. Um, uh, so along with their beauty and some of their utility, the other uh, obvious thing for, I think, uh, um, obviously the birds, the bees, the butterflies, is the fact that native plants have evolved over thousands of years. So there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship between uh, the native wildlife as well as um, these plants. So, um, um, so uh, the first plant I picked was uh, um, Clethra ulnifolia, which is uh, also called summer sweet. Uh, has a couple common names, but summer sweet is probably the most common. So Clethra ulnifolia is a uh, an oval-shaped upright shrub that can sucker. Uh, has uh, it can form broad colonies. Um, uh, it blooms on uh, early growth in um, um, uh, blooms on early new growth. Okay. So uh, you, you could, if you wanted to prune it, you would prune it uh, in late winter because it will bring out new foliage, which will bring out new flowers that year. Foliage is very soft. Uh, it's probably um, eight feet tall in its natural form. There are many, many cultivars, which, which are a lot shorter. Also, a lot of the cultivars are pink. Um, straight on the folia is uh, white, white flowers. It's kind of a bottle brush kind of flower. And um, it's a um, uh, deciduous, so it loses its foliage in the, uh, the winter time. Um, it really likes a moist area, okay? Easy to grow, uh, medium to wet soils, uh, 
full sun, part shade, tolerates clay, uh, no serious pests. Occasionally it might get aphids, but n nothing out of the ordinary. It's nothing that any of the beneficial critters that come to your garden uh, would not take care of. So I, I would never think about spraying it, nothing like that. Um, like I said, yellow uh, fall foliage, uh, great for bees, great for butterflies, uh, even hummingbirds. Um, and the, uh, the cultivars have kind of a slight pink um, a fragrance to it. Uh, I thought they might be a little bit uh, okay against the deer, but I can tell you that, that in my garden, once, uh, <laughs> once I planted it, the, the deer just loved it. They just, it, it didn't do well at all. So I went ahead and uh, I dug it up and put it in the backyard where I have a fence and now it's fine. So uh, the deer will probably eat it to the ground. Um, so be careful of that. So that was Clethra olifolia. And again, a lot of the cultivars are uh, a little bit on the, uh, they're much shorter, okay? So you don't have to, uh, and um, uh, two common cultivars. One is Clethra olifolia ruby spice, and the other one is uh, called hummingbird. So, and um, the ruby spice is kind of a pinkish, reddish uh, flower. And the hummingbird is shorter. It's, it's also white though. Okay, uh, Alex, I'm able to share the screen. Okay. So I have shared the screen and you will be able to uh, go ahead and um, uh, uh, talk about the plants. You're just gonna have to let me know to be able to uh, move forward. On okay, that yep, sounds good. Right now I'm on, uh, uh, Itea Virginiana, or, or Virginica, uh, which is a uh, Virginia sweet spire. So it's the second plant in there, Cindy. Okay, uh, I'm on sweet spire. Yeah, so uh, Virginia, sweet, Virginia sweet spire is, um, loves moist areas again, uh, almost even wet areas you could even call it, uh, takes just about any place, variable soil very, very easily. It forms thickets, kind of a very thick, um, almost hedge as it gets a little bit older. Uh, as the as the shrub uh, gets um, older, it will um, uh, the stems will turn almost red brown in color and start to exfoliate just a little bit. Nothing too exciting, but you can see what it's doing in there. And uh, as you can see, the flowers there, the the flowers do droop forward and droop down. Uh, and uh, the big thing for me is the uh, the fall color. Go to the next slide there, Cindy. The fall color okay. one uh, is is very very colorful. Uh, you know the it's just it, the one on the left is that beautiful hedge and the one on the right is that great great fall color um, and it's just really really a uh, top-notch plant for lots of reasons maybe even try it into maybe a rain garden because it can it, it can take uh, a moist setting it's great for bees butterflies um, it does flower on old wood so you'd want to prune it right after it flowers that's where it has plenty of time to put out wood before the next flowering season okay so if you were to like prune it in the fall you just took off next year's flowers okay so you want to do it almost right away uh no insects uh, to speak of um and um there are also a lot of uh, cultivars as well you know different more intense uh, uh, fall color uh probably a shorter uh, a shorter shrub in general so it's, a, it's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty neat plant. And I think it has uh, a lot to offer and a lot, to, a lot, lot going for it. And, and also one more thing, and that is that, that hedge photo that you saw, uh, you can imagine even when the foliage is all gone, because it is deciduous, a bird is going to find a nice kind of home in there for the winter. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of it forms this nice thicket, so which is kind of neat. So moving on there, Cindy, to uh, Father Gila Gardenia. So this is also called the dwarf father gilla. Uh, father gilla is a uh, small um, multi-season shrub, uh, bottle brush flowers, um, kind of that bluish greenish uh, throughout the summer. And I've always felt that uh, anything in the hemimalis family, which is the witch hazel family, and this guy is included in that, they've got an incredible fall color. So it's got great, great, great fall color, kind of a, Orange, uh, uh, orange, reddish, then the orangey, then a little bit yellow before it fades off. Maybe even some burgundy thrown in and crimson. Um, the uh, the 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 flower comes out before the leaves do, so there's no competition. So it's kind of a, a nice uh, shape to it, nice silhouette with the nice uh, flowers on top. 
and there's no competition. It just, just the flowers themselves, which is kind of neat. Uh, they are a little bit shallow rooted, so maybe a thin layer of mulch might help with uh, soil temperature moderation, particularly in the, the summer. It likes it, um, probably the best way to say it would be, it would be moist soil, but well drained. Now it's kind of a hard thing to do sometimes, but definitely don't let it go into that hot part of July and August with uh, no additional moisture. It's got to have some so, um, some water to it, uh, some additional water. Um, and it's great for uh, bees and hummingbirds. Uh, the flowers smell kind of nice. I can never uh, sense the smell, but it's very, very faint, but it's, it must, I hear it smells like honey. It does, it um, does. I have I, one. I hear that a lot. <laughs> so next slide. And, um, and uh, you got the next one? Yep, turn that up. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, there'll be a bit of a delay, you know. I heard, sorry, <laughs> Uh, so, and um, yeah, so there's the fall color on the, on the right and then the, the nice cute little flowers on the, on the left. Uh, and there's lots of lots of varieties that are out there in the world. Oh, and by the way, because of the bluish foliage that you get in the summer, it should mm -hmm. be pretty good against the deer. The deer are not going to like that um, bluish um, look to it because there must be chemicals that make it blue, which they're not going to like, which is kind of helpful. So. Uh, the deer are a big thing to me because they'll eat everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, going on to the next one there is uh, Hemimelis virginiana, uh, witch hazel. Uh, this is a uh, good size, very, very big. Got to give it some space. Uh, it can be, you know, 17, 20 feet, somewhere in that range. Uh, irregular shape. So if you want it too perfectly like a very, very tall, upright crepe myrtle. It's not gonna necessarily be it. It's gonna be a little bit more irregular. And I think that's kind of the beauty of it. It does what it does. Um, I would say the best place to put it would be a part, um, in, in part shade, it has a little bit more of an open habit. If it's in sun, it might be a little bit thicker, maybe even better fall color, but it certainly can take um, sh um, shade. A uh, wide range of soils, um, it could even take clay. I don't think that would harm it too much. Uh, mulch is a good thing to keep it uh, moist. Much like the Faba Gillis, stay away from that dry, dry, dry period in July and August. So give it a little bit of moisture, a little bit of irrigation if you have to. Uh, yellow flowers in the fall uh, big, and, and uh, yellow fall foliage. Okay. That, it that's is later on. beautiful it has a nice... if you put it in front of an evergreen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, and you can go to the next one. So, and there's a nice shot of the kind of the, um, have an open habit in someone's garden. And on the, on the left is a, is, a, is a roadway where it's on that border between the forest and an open area. So I see it's kind of leaning into the road a little bit. So, um, because it's really, really nice, great plant for let's say the back of your backyard looking towards the house, I think would, would always be a, a good thing to have. All right. Moving on to the next one, uh, is New Jersey tea, Cianothus americanus, is a uh, very uh, low, low, gro low growing shrub, um, kind of a burst of white flowers. The flowers are very intensely white. It's very, very pretty. That, and when they're all blooming as it gets mature, you, you can barely see the foliage. It's pretty thick on top. Um, it's almost, it's short and not, it's too tall probably to be a ground cover, but it's, it's, it's pretty short, it's kind of neat. So, and uh, so I'd say, you know, something like three feet tall, um, full sun, um, well, well drained. It probably would not like uh, standing water or any, anything like that. Uh, the plants can die back in the winter and, you know, come, let's say February, you might say it doesn't look very good. I don't know if this is gonna, <laughs> gonna come back, but they are pretty tough. So I had that experience last year. I planted one last fall. Maybe I planted it too late. It did look very good for the longest time and then I, about two months ago or a month and a half ago, I saw it was coming and now it looks pretty good. It's about the size of volleyball now. So it's really, really good size. Um, like I said, full sun is, it is your best, but it's great for um, um, uh, butterflies and great for all your um, pollinators, particularly also early. Remember you want some pollinators that are early, mid and late in your seasons. That way you'll, that way you'll get the most species. Um, and um, it's a it's a it's a really really nice plant. It's very very I think underutilized. It's cute so, as a button. 
I'm sorry? It's as oh, cute yeah. as a button. <laughs> oh, yeah, one thing I wanted to say in that from the very beginning, I forgot, that pretty much everything on my plant list, all, all the plants here, tw all 25 plants, nothing is rare, or unusual, or difficult to find. Everything here should be very, very easy to find wherever you get your plants, okay? So, Great. and this one here is probably not the most common, but still it's, it's fairly common and pretty easy to get to. Okay. Excellent. Uh, okay, so this is Alex Glabra. This is an uh, ink berry. Um, this is kind of the plant that's uh, probably good for a rain garden. It's happiest with low-lying areas, uh, foundation plants. Uh, if, 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 you, if you want to, probably could be up against the house. Um, not particularly showy in flowers. The, the, the flowers are very much understated. The, the little berry there is very, very much understated. Uh, but it is evergreen. And remember, there's not that many broadleaf evergreens that are native to our area here. There's, there's not a lot. And inkberry is one of them. You know, so you probably list maybe five plants, broadleaf evergreens, and so they're native. So, um, and it's a, uh, um, you know, it, again, because it's evergreen, it can give you the screening effect. It can give you the foundation planting that's, you know, kind of important for when we map out our gardens. You gave me a tip yesterday that was just outstanding. So mm -hmm. this picture illustrates uh, the tip that you gave me with the aster in front of the inkberry in this situation. Can mm -hmm. you explain why that's important to cite this so well? Sure. Um, the, uh, the plant on the left there, that's uh, a little hedge there. And you can see it gets kind of open down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whereas the, the image on the right, that has that beautiful aster in front of it. So by doing that, he's screening the, the, uh, the bare patches, if you will. And now it looks completely filled in and you wouldn't think Beautiful. Ink berries have a, a bare patch, but, you, but there obviously is. So, yeah. but that's a, that's a great, great uh, way to kind of use plants that we have. And I love Astro Blongifolius anyway, so it's kind of a, a neat thing. It's a great color combination. So. It is yeah. a, a great tip for using it. So mm -hmm. this, this is probably my favorite of all the ones you've shown. Good, wow. Yeah, I don't hear that every day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, moving along here to uh, uh, winterberry, Ilex verticillata. Uh, and it's a deciduous holly, meaning it loses its foliage. Um, multi-stemmed, multi-branched. Uh, and it's great for all things. So it's a nice structure in the wintertime, nice upright stems coming right out of the ground. Uh, pretty muscular, like I said, pretty good size. Uh, cute little flowers in the spring, uh, nice dark green foliage all summer. Uh, then it has the berries, and then you have the uh, yellow uh, fall color. Um, and uh, it could take a yeah, fair, fair amount of moisture, fair amount of uh, water, um, probably even good for some uh, rain garden um, applications. Um, the flowers are really unremarkable though, they're very small. But every one of those little berries you see would have been a flower. So you can see the flowers are, are pretty tiny. Um, but the birds will go wacko on the, the berries, which is really, really fun to see. And they'll probably strip all the berries off, no matter how, how many you have within maybe one or two days. It'll just all be gone. So it's, it's kind of fun to watch that. So Yeah, and uh, it's fun to watch the mockingbirds sit in here and guard it. But mm -hmm. we're getting questions, uh, a lot of questions about, uh, can you notate when the shrubs that you're highlighting, uh, if they're deer resistant or not? Sure. And also, uh, in this case, yes, just like all hollies, uh, ilexes have male and female flowers and male and female plants. So you do need both if you want to have the berries. Isn't that correct, Alex? Yes, exactly. You need, a, you need a male, female. The big thing when you order or you go to your garden center, make sure that you get it so that um, uh, you yeah, need two different, uh, you need a male and female, obviously, but then make sure that you look at the tag or you look, you do some research to make sure they bloom at the same time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do any good if one's blooming in early and one is blooming in late in the season and whoop, they're not going to pound each other. Okay, so they need to be booming at the same time. So you need two earlies or two lates or two mids or whatever the case may be, okay? Uh, and oftentimes uh, they'll have literature that says this is a good pollinator for this. Or maybe that's just the easiest way of doing it. But yep, okay. So yeah, you need a male and female. Is this okay. deer resistant? Uh, most of your, like you said, most of the hollies are. Uh, this is not prickly. Uh, I've never um, 
uh, had it where it got uh, hit by the deer at my house. They left it alone. The big thing with this is it gets fairly um, big and muscular. And so if they did browse on a little bit, I don't think it would matter because it's, it's a pretty good sized uh, uh, shrub, which is, you know, which is cool. But yeah, for the most part, I think is it would be a pretty safe rule that, that uh, Verticillata would be, I think, pretty good against the deer. Yeah. And, okay. and to let our audience know, um, there are a lot of raised hands right now, but we will be saving the questions to the end. And if we don't get a chance to answer all the questions, we are posting uh, the answers or the questions and answers to our website next week, just like we did for last week's uh, video. So go ahead and lower your hands. We'll get to the questions at the end. Uh, and even though we're running a little bit late, we'll, we'll still answer quite a few of the questions, but they will for sure be posted on our website next week. So we'll go ahead and, and move forward with red chokeberry. Yes. Does it really make you choke? Uh, <laughs> actually, I think the, um, um, there, there's something in the, uh, the, the berry itself, which is actually distasteful. And you think about it, I guess that's uh, natural selection because uh, the plant wants the bird to come grab it, fly a certain distance, think it's disgusting, and then want to drop it right? Takes a little bit, maybe some sweetness out of it. Once you get to the inner part, thinks it's gross, drops it, and then it spreads the seed, spreads the, uh, spreads the plant from propagating somewhere else. It's not going to get mama's way here. So uh, yeah, so yeah, there actually is something about that chokeberry. So, um, mm -hmm. but it's another multi-stemmed, a little bit, the body a little bit close to the Alec fruticillata. Um, multi-stemmed, the white flowers are a little bit more obvious, a little bit more out there. Uh, the, the berries are a little bit fatter than, than you had on the, uh, um, than on the, the ilex, the winter berry. Uh, the fall color here is, you know, reddish, um, all those kind of scarlet, orangey thing you see right there. Whereas in the, um, the ilex, it was uh, yellow. So if you like this color a little bit more, that's an option. It's great. And both for, of them can be trimmed because they can get pretty leggy. Oh, yeah, for sure. These, these guys can, uh, can take quite a bit. Uh, this guy would also... Also like um, uh, plenty of moisture, you know, almost like a rain garden situation. Um, certainly can handle being inundated with water. That's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it is deciduous. So you would prune it uh, after, right after the flowering. Uh, and or you, you, you uh, can, right after the fruiting, because if you prune right after the flowering, you're going oh, to cut off some of the berries. Yep, uh, right. Same thing for the ilex. Uh, decidua and verticillata. So yeah, be careful when you prune because if you prune after something flowers, you're going to cut off the berries. If you prune before something flowers, then you're pretty set. Yeah. Um, and the, the good thing is it has so many stems. If you had to knock a cane out of there or knock a stem out of there, I don't know if you really know the difference. Um, but obviously if you went and like took a side off of it, tried to, you know, shear it, then obviously you would take off flower. Right. Um, same principles before, it might get a little bit open down there on the bottom. So planting some perennials or something might, might not be a bad idea. Right, um, and I've moved forward to its cousin, which I think is delicious. Uh, mm -hmm. Cool, yep. Uh, the, uh, the black choke cherry uh, is, has a little bit more of a fatter, plumper um, fruit on it. Um, looks a little juicier. And it gets to the point where it's ripe in a little bit later in the season. Mm -hmm. So it does bring in a different group of birds, which is kind of neat. Um, I, I have seen deer both on the red and the black go after the foliage a little bit. So that's not something that, that I would say is, is deer proof. I've seen deer go after both of these guys. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the, um, the foliage might be a little bit more uh, reddish purplish, a little bit darker than the, than the, um, uh, the red choke cherry. Mm -hmm. It's right. a little bit leggier too, but mm -hmm. at yep. least you can make uh, this one into a jam, which is delicious. Yeah. And, and it, it, it handles the, the pruning just as well. So mm -hmm. uh, next one. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, Rus aromatica. It's kind of a, kind of a, no one will ever say this is their favorite plant, <laughs> but, but I, think, <laughs> I think it's really neat because it's low, it's thick, uh, kind of a dense mass, a great shrub for stabilizing a bank. Um, uh, they probably in the in the wild. I had a hard time finding a good size in the wild. So anywhere between two to five to five to ten. 
but there is one uh, low growing uh, cultivar, which is called low grow, um, yeah. two to three feet tall, but it gets quite wide. So you can imagine how that would be good in kind of a bank situation, like a big hill. Mm -hmm. uh, great, great fall color, um, adapts well to just about anything. So alkaline soil, acid soil, dry soils, wet soil, don't worry about it. It, it really, really is pretty rock solid. You know, this is a good time to bring this point up, though, because there is controversy about planting the cultivars versus the straight species. So I love grow low. To me, that is a, mm -hmm. a, a more beneficial plant in uh, my landscape. So what do you feel about, I know there's differing opinions, but what do you feel uh, right. species versus cultivar? Yeah, sure. If, if we, let's say, if uh, we were, let's say, land managers and we were conservationists or something, and you had, uh, and you were trying to, <laughs> I'm my dog. <laughs> if, 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 you, if you were trying, if you were trying to be, uh, uh, yeah, be bioconservationist, you probably have to be straight genus and species. But if we are going to be, let's say, a suburban homeowner, and you wanted to increase the birds, bees, and butterflies, I think you certainly can use cultivars. Having said that. A lot of studies have come out saying that sometimes if we make some of the, uh, the berries on the winter berry too fat and too succulent, then, then maybe some of the birds have a hard time grabbing them. Or maybe by the time that winter berry matures, maybe the birds that usually feed on winter berry, they're long gone because the season is different for them. Or sometimes if it's a big flower, like all, this, uh, all the echinaceas, that they made double flowers now, mm -hmm. the bees have a hard time getting in there and pollinating. So I Good do point. think that the jury is out in some ways. Uh, there's a lot more research to be done. Um, but um, uh, in, in many ways, if you're trying to sell your garden on a homeowner's uh, HOA type situation or in front of a building or something that you're responsible for putting plants in front of, using the cultivars, it, it, it helps a lot because they put out more flowers. They're a little bit, in this case, a little bit not like a, you know, a wild thing. Uh, the, the low grow is a little bit lower. Um, so there are some maybe some things to look at and kind of scratch your head. I, w I would never say it, anything is black and white, but I also don't right. want to ever say no. That, so I, it's, it's all, everything's always an open question, that's for sure. Oh, that's great. So, oh, this, this, this is, I love this because I have woods behind my house and mm -hmm. this is growing everywhere. Uh, so tell us about the arrowwood. Yeah, the, uh, the viburnum dentatum. Um, Another very tall, very erect, um, every, known for its uh, durability, its use in the landscape, uh, has, has your classic viburnum flower, uh, fl flat top, um, kind of mid-spring to um, starts to bloom, has very, very attractive uh, dark blue uh, fruit in September, and I think some pretty cool foliage in, in the fall. Uh, I, do, I did have a lot of eating on this on my deer at my house, and here in Maryland, they just, they just destroyed it. So one night. So <laughs> uh, usually when I come home with a pot at night, if, if I buy a plant at a nursery, I'll come home and I'll take the pot and I'll just leave it in my driveway just to see if anybody comes to get it. Oh, that's and, then I, and then I come out, I don't even plant it. And then, and then in the morning, it, it, if it's good, then, then I'll put it in the front yard and give it a shot. But sometimes it just goes right to the backyard as soon as I see that. So um, <laughs> because they, they did really everything. Um, <laughs> And uh, viburnums, you know, flower on old, uh, on old uh, stems. So, and Cindy's point about you have to be careful when to prune because if you prune too early, uh, you know, and that whole thing with the with the fruit and then the flowers next year. So, um, oh, by the way, it is the uh, the larval host of the uh, blue azure butterfly, which is oh, kind of, I didn't so, know and that. And it's a good nectar plant for the uh, red admiral too. So Excellent. viburnum dentatum is one of my favorite. And you look at the color picture, the, the colorful picture there for the fall color and the, 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 the fruit set. That one on the right there is blue muffin and it has a, lots and lots of berries, which is, which is really, really cool. So Great. next slide. And beautiful uh, fall foliage. Yeah, so here we are with um, uh, viburnum uh, nudum. Um, this is um, a plant that's um, one of my favorite, I think it's one of my favorite plants. It does do, at least in my yard, slightly better with the deer. So if you like that viburnum flower, you will get something good with the deer, which is great. So a little bit more protection, if you will. Um, yeah. Do you ever use any chemicals to, to uh, keep the deer away? 
Uh, usually on some of my annuals and maybe a perennial here or there, but I'm not going to do all my shrubs, no. Me neither. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, but a pretty good size, maybe eight feet tall, uh, upright, a little bit more arching than the uh, um, than dentatum, kind of a more of a shiny leaf, a longer leaf. I think it's great uh, green foliage as well as the fall color. I'm, I'm very, very fond of. Mm -hmm. uh, the fall color is kind of that maroon, very dark purple. Um, and, um, oh boy, it's also maybe a good candidate also for a rain garden as well. Mm -hmm. So, and there are tons of um, cultivars now if you're interested in maybe finding ones a little shorter. So, but great, great, great plant. One, one, one of my favorites. Mine so, too. Mine too. This is gorgeous in the landscape. Yeah, there's that landscape picture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely and, uh, beautiful. Yeah, it's great stuff. So, um, fabulous. Next, so, next how slide, about the nine uh, bark? Oh, yeah. One, also, one of my favorites um, is a very, very uh, super tough, super hardy, very, very tolerant of uh, drought. Uh, once you get it established, I guess the word is resilient or just, or just tough or tough as nails. It's one of the few plants that probably will bring you uh, uh, seasonal, seasonal interest all year long. Mm -hmm. So as pinkish uh, uh, flowers in the uh, pinkish white in um, late spring, uh, the fruit persists um, quite a bit into the fall. Tiny, you can't really see it because it's kind of in there, but exfoliating bark. Maybe when it gets older, you'll be able to see that. Um, and um, let's see. Uh, I, I've also found it good against the deer. We don't don't touch it at my house. Don't, don't even no, don't even look at it, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, you might need to thin it a little bit over time. Let's say within five years after planting it, maybe three years. Because it, it is kind of a muscular ombre. It really knows what he wants to do and he really, really goes to town. So, and he would love it. He, he's not going to be uh, shy or bashful at that point. Just prune away if you want. Okay. Beautiful so, plant. Great plant. Oh, okay, then this is really my favorite. Hmm? I think the oh. favorite is whatever pops up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we have uh, the fringe tree, uh, Chinensis virginicus. It's a, um, oh boy, it, it, like you said, it's kind of, Kind of my favorite too, actually. Uh, but it's a multi-stemmed again. Uh, I've even seen it into a tree, not mm -hmm. so much a shrub. I think it's great for any uh, uh, native woodlands type garden. Uh, the, the flowers are fragrant. Um, I don't, I can't remember if, hmm, I was thinking about the deer. I've never seen it get totally shellacked by the deer. So no. that, at least that says something. Uh, it, it also uh, flowers on the previous year's growth. Uh, we had, when I, when I worked there in space, uh, we had a one on the south side of the building, full blazing sun. The irrigation kind of worked when it wanted to, so it took all that, no problem. Uh, and we were right there on Independence Avenue, so there's lots of traffic, lots of pollution. So I think it's really, really good in kind of an urban situation. If you, could, if you needed to plant it, let's say, in the front of your townhouse or something, it's not too tall. And uh, it, it, some, some shade as it got a little bit older uh, and great flowers, of course, uh, but also would give you some tolerance to just about anything. So, and if you go to the last picture there on the, on the fringe tree, you got the cute little uh, blue, uh, uh, what they call a droop, not really a berry. Right. But, um, and you can see the way it hits that building there on, on the left, the brick building. It's great, great color. Uh, the combination, good, good contrast, nice shape in the landscape too. So. Best to plant by a window so you could smell its fragrance before, because mm -hmm. it usually blooms a little bit too early to go outside and admire it all night long. You know, this is a good point or a good time to ask this question. Are any of these berries poisonous to people? I know I would never uh, <laughs> tell anyone to chow down on a, an ilex on a holly berry because those are poisonous. Right. But I, I, we, we'll put that in the handout at the end because mm -hmm. I know some of them are toxic and some of them are not. Some of them you can actually eat like the uh, 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 black chokeberry. Uh, but yeah, now this, here's another good point. For this tree, just like the holly, you need a male and a female because uh, Cayenanthus yep. does have both. Uh, so mm -hmm. you do want to uh, sex it out at the nursery and uh, know what you're buying. Uh, usually it will bloom anyway. It just may not produce, of course, it's not going to produce the uh, droops if it doesn't have a male nearby, mm -hmm. correct? Right, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So I like it for the flowers, not necessarily. Yeah, and and typically, it doesn't have to be like side by side. They can have yeah. a little bit of distance. Right. So, right. Yeah. So flowers are going to happen no matter what. It just mm -hmm. needs a, a male to produce the berries. Right. Uh, button bush. Oh, this is, somebody asked, can you plant things in uh, uh, wet conditions? This is the best. Right. Yeah. This is another super duper tough, um, kind of very very muscular uh, plant. Pretty good size. Uh, many of the cultivars are going to make it more for the uh, average gardener because it's, it's a, the cultivars are shorter, mm -hmm. which is nice. Uh, you, if you do have it in an area where it's, it's too dry uh, and you don't give it some irrigation, let's say, in that July and August period, it probably wouldn't kill the plant. Um, it's not going to drop leaves or anything, but it might not flower as much. So mm -hmm. over time, that could have an effect on it. But full sun... Man, part shade maybe, but the full sun's better uh, and um, likes wet soils. Um, great, huge. This is probably, I get more comments on this from, from people I talk to about butterflies. They say you stick one of these in within almost no time at all. When it flowers, you get butterflies like crazy. So that's perfect a perfect replacement for a butterfly bush. Perfect. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. And yep. some of the shorter ones. So, yep. Yep. I agree. Yeah. So we're going to move on. I'm going to move you a little bit faster because uh, even though we started a little bit late, I want to make sure that we save time for questions. So uh, even though I'm asking some along the way, but I'm mm -hmm. not going to be able to ask all of them. So okay. how about this? Now, actually, this is my, my favorite plant. Um, very hardy, very adaptable shrub, um, kind of almost explosion like uh, flowers. Be beautiful, I think. Um, the, the, uh, they, they fade into the summer with that, almost with those balls. If you go to the next picture, that next picture, mm -hmm. uh, that's it, that's after the flowers kind of spent as we go through the season, and then it gets turned brown in, into fall. Um, it, it, it uh, for the most part, not, back to the deer thing real quick, did not go with deer right away. Deer will not make this their first choice, not at least not in my garden, which was kind of surprising because it will eat some of my other hydrangeas. Uh, but rich soil, pretty good with different pHs, um, best with uh, part shade, and a good lay. If you're going to have it in sun, it'll probably flower more, but then you might want to maybe a little bit of mulch. And also mm -hmm. be aware of the irrigation, like I said, during the, the hot, uh, crummy times of uh, summer. Yeah, it's uh, blooming right now in the woods around us. So right. In mm -hmm. the middle of Atlantic area, it's beautiful. And, and it's good for uh, insects, all kinds of insects, as well as uh, butterflies. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And if you want to go to the next one? You got to move along here. <laughs> oak leaf hydrangea. Oak leaf hydrangea. Um, it's a shrub. It's uh, probably uh, a little bit shorter, probably, I don't know, five to seven feet. Um, once it gets mature, irregular in shape. Obviously, the, the foliage looks like an oak. Um, like an oak. Um, fantastic fall color. If you want to go to that mm, the last slide, I had three oak leaf pictures. That last one has great uh, color, color combination. Um, let's see. Uh, it's very fragrant. It's blooming outside my window right now. Mm, cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exfoliating bark in the winter time, which is kind of nice. Um, and uh, much the same with um, um, uh, butterflies uh, as well. Although we'll go after the uh, flower, um, but not as much as this one. The mm -hmm. mountain laurel and and oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. pollinators are pretty amazing. Yep, and again, it's another broadleaf evergreen for this area, which is not exactly the easiest thing in the, the world to find. The deer will pretty much, I think it's safe to say, leave this alone. It is an acid-loving plant, mm -hmm. so plant it in the kind, same kind of atmosphere you would have uh, azaleas. Um, so, you know, acid-loving woodlands kind of, kind of setting. Um, and um, uh, it tolerates probably, you're always going to need at least probably part shade. So at, at least, don't go, you, I guess, could have it in full sun, but probably not around where we live, maybe or higher north. Um, but humusy soil, uh, well-drained, great against the deer. Uh, it's even larval food for the northern um, blue butterfly, which is kind of nice. Um, and it's a, it, it's a great plant, so. Yeah, yeah, to me, this is a tease because it likes it even, uh, I got an uh, email from one of our participants a couple days ago, and they wanted to know the difference differences between zones. So when you buy a plant, usually it has the zones uh, mm -hmm. range that prefer or, uh, the heat 
the amount of heat that we get, but uh, or cold tolerance, I should say, not the heat tolerance. Mm -hmm. This is one you could plant in zone seven in Washington state, and it's gonna be much happier than zone seven in the mid-Atlantic because okay. of our hot evenings and hot and humid daytime. So this is where it really pays to know what your nighttime temperatures are too, because something like this in rhododendrons really do like to cool down at night, so. Mm -hmm. But right. who doesn't want these little cute cake decorations okay. in there? Oh, and, there's, and there's lots of cultivars, lots of yeah. different colors yeah. and, 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 and sizes of the shrub too. And we will post the, again, we will post this video on our website next Wednesday and people will be able to look at the pictures and decide which ones they want in their garden. Mm -hmm. So many fabulous choices. So uh, let's see here. Next one. Yep. We got, we got high bush blueberry. Yep. Um, uh, in the wild, pretty tall, but there's lots of cultivars, which, um, which are shorter, of course. But uh, much like you would uh, e expect with a blueberry, um, moist soil, uh, acid loving, uh, nat naturally found in uh, bogs and, and um, uh, swampy areas. Uh, but it's got to be well drained, which is kind of tricky sometimes. Mm -hmm. I said that earlier. Um, and uh, let's see. So, like I said, a pH, you know between four to maybe five, somewhere in there, kind of like a holly, rhododendron, azaleas, camellia, in that, in that range. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, you, you would want to have, like I said before, you need a male and female in order to, not, not a male and female, but you need no, to have- you need different cultivars. Yeah, you need different cultivars blooming at the same time, which is kind of tricky again. So make sure you know what you're doing there. Make do a little bit of homework before you go out and, and purchase. So different cultivars blooming at the same time. Mm -hmm. right. And this one's like the Calmia. It really is much happier where the temperatures are cooler in the evening. Uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. like to bake all day long. So just to know, everybody says, if you're going to grow an edible gr garden, plant blueberries. They do great. No, it, just like the Calmia, they really do appreciate cool temperatures in the evening. So right. a little bit yeah. tricky. Mm -hmm. So now we're on to silky dogwood, which is yeah. beautiful. Um, it, it can get quite large, can get pretty big, uh, it, it pretty muscular, there's, there's no doubt about that. A kind of a creamy, creamy flower, uh, white, white spring flower, really nice dark foliage, um, does have the reddish stems, uh, mm -hmm. kind of um, reddish almost burgundy in the fall. Uh, it's probably another one of these four season plants that has something to do all the time. Uh, I would say Deer could be a problem for sure. They will, they will probably want to nibble this thing down to at least probably take the foliage off and then probably go after the stems after that. Um, and uh, so that's definitely a problem if, if people have uh, deer issues. Mm -hmm. um, but it has so much to offer in terms of uh, late summer uh, uh, fruit uh, for the songbirds and other critters. Um, the fruit's kind of that porcelain color. It's, it's, quite, it's quite attractive. Um, and it's, it's, if you can do it with the deer, and I think you should try it someplace. That's absolutely. Maybe that's the one thing you do want to spray. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or you want to have uh, so. I moved us on to the red twig dogwood. Mm -hmm. I'm getting prompted by our helpers that we have 15 minutes left. So okay. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put the hammer down. I'll speed okay. them up. <laughs> the so. recording won't stop. So yeah. go okay. ahead. Keep going. So uh, that, in that picture on the left, I took uh, in, in March at uh, American History. Uh, on the National Mall, so that's 12th Street right there, and wow. those plants look pretty sickly in about uh, January. We probably got some road salt from when, when we plow. They look pretty bad, and we and the American History team and I went out there. We chopped them down, we cleaned them up, we pruned them out, and by March they look like that. And now mm -hmm. they're even taller by at least another foot, at least maybe even two feet. So mm -hmm. great plant has that uh, reddish stem, um, and it's. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's a really, really cool plant. Do you uh, find this one to be short-lived? Some of our shrubs do have a problem in our, in, at least in our temperatures. Mm -hmm. I don't know about uh, around uh, different zones, but... Well, uh, uh, the big thing with the shrubby dogwoods is they get oftentimes canker. Mm. And I don't know if you can see that picture on the right there. There's a little mm -hmm. bit dark areas on the stem. Uh, and that one on the left, the reason we pruned it so hard was because of canker. We, we, and, we, and we pruned it and we sanitized with a little bit of Lysol between cuts. Um, to not to not make it worse, and it did that. So if I have to go in there and prune it once in a while, but it looks like that every year, then maybe it's okay. I so think the irrigation right. there is not great, by the way. So which I thought I would have to have because it's kind of a tough spot, and he likes moisture, but it seems to do pretty good. Yeah, so, I have a 
problem sometimes with saw flies, but uh, mm -hmm. then you just go in and I pulled off the, the little larva when mm -hmm. I saw them started to get on there. So not bad. Now, somebody did ask about azaleas. What do you plant for native azaleas? Then I knew that these slides were coming up, so uh -huh. I kept I kept right. quiet so you can right. explain this. So uh, the uh, three uh, species I was going to lo look at would be the coastal azalea, which is a phanticum, uh, paramac paramacloides, which is a uh, pinkster, and viscosum, which is the uh, swamp azalea. But, but all, all in all, it's a spectacular group. It is a little bit more rare than the other plants in the presentation. Uh, you can toss out your image of, of, of grandma's azalea, which was kind of a evergreen, but kind of a low moundy tight kind of mushroom thing. This is much more airy, much more open. Um, so a little tricky because got to have moisture, but good drainage, you know, in that whole scenario. So it's kind of tricky sometimes. Um, but if you find the right spot and you do a little bit of trial and error, maybe, maybe you'll get lucky. Uh, but they have so much to offer because they have these incredible flowers. So the next, the first one is Atlanticum, uh, which is very, very pretty. It is kind of rare now in the wild. So maybe it's a good thing that homeowners would, would plant this in their gardens. Uh, it needs a little bit of uh, protection from the winter. Um, but um, it is, uh, uh, it spreads with underground uh, stolons, if you will. And that means the roots are fairly shallow, so a good little layer of mulch like fine pine or pine straw would be good. Uh, the next one is the pinkster. Um, it's a little bit more, if it's in the, like she said, Cindy, if it's a little bit more uh, of a shadier, I'm sorry, if it's in the higher latitudes, like maybe New York State, maybe um, something of that nature, Michigan or somewhere, maybe it could take uh, more um, sun, okay? Um, probably a little bit on the driest side. Uh, poor, poor drainage will probably not be very good for this. Um, but be, and again, because it's shallow rooted, nice little layer of mulch conserve moisture though. Uh, um, so, and the last one is viscosum, and viscosum actually is the uh, uh, um, uh, swamp azalea, and actually is one of the one that can be periodically inundated with water. And actually, as long as let's say at dinner time you got a big thunderstorm got a lot of water, but by breakfast, the water is gone. That's how I kind of would define being inundated. So mm -hmm. if it's still there, all that water is still there at lunch or even the next dinner time, that's probably too much and too long. But if it, it can take a lot of water, as long as it gets out of there, this guy should be fine. Yeah, believe it or uh, not, this grows in the drainage ditches by my house, mm -hmm. uh, but on the side. So it does exactly what you're saying. When it floods, it's fine. And as soon as it, it dries out a little bit, it helps oscillate between the two conditions. So mm -hmm. going on to, this is our last slide. So please yep. tell us about how delicious this one is. Yeah. <laughs> so this is actually one of my, my favorite small trees or shrubs. Uh, this is a, a service berry. In this case, it's a, a Amelanchol avius, and he got very, very pronounced flowers, pretty, pretty good sized flowers. Um, uh, and also as good as an understory. So good for a, a good woodlands garden. Um, early early spring flower and the fall color is that uh, uh, orangey kind of bronzy look to it. Uh, it's good for if you had a, you know, almost a specimen, I think you could easily get by. And it also nice is, is it blooms before dogwoods. So it's kind of adds to the, the color season before the dogwood comes, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, acidic soil. Um, and uh, the uh, berries are edible. You asked a question about uh, berries being edible. It will take clay soil, which is nice. Uh, I planted one in my mom's yard years ago, and the deer did mess with this, the bark. I guess they put their antlers on there, you know, they're, they're kind of rutting or doing whatever as they do. But they didn't mess with the foliage at all, but they did go after the bark a little bit. So hmm. I don't know if that was that specific tree or amelanchers in general. So, but um, it's a, it's a Great, great, great plant. So I, I think any native garden, if you need a, uh, and also there's there's other canadensis, there's an arborea, there's a couple other uh, amelanchier species that are great. So, mm -hmm. but right. just like you uh, said before, uh, amelanchier and many of the other native plants, native shrubs that you showed, uh, they like the edge of the forest, like our dogwoods do. And so when you put them out in full sun be careful, you better be in a cooler zone. Uh, I've seen these used in shopping centers, which I'm always mm -hmm. amazed that they're doing that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, 
Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not the best spot. It's okay for Johnstown, Pennsylvania, but not so much for Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. uh, to have it out in full sun. And I just got a, another one. This is a lot of our native plants are by hosts for different funguses and diseases. And this one uh, has the uh, wonderful, <laughs> I'm joking, uh, capability of being a by host for the, uh, it's not apple rust, uh, but it's a, another rust that appears on the amelanchiers that is a, a co host with one of the evergreens, the junipers, I do believe. And so uh, if you're, have you ever had that problem with your Amelanch ears? Uh, yeah, sure. That's the Amelanch or um, quince, I believe it is. Yes. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, much like the cedar apple rust is the is, is, uh, jun juniperus virginiana as well as apple trees. So it's the same scenario. Uh, I have had that where the, the fruit comes out, looks pretty good. And all of a sudden it's just filled with these little orange like protrusions everywhere. It looks kind of kind of wacky. Um, it doesn't really harm the tree at all, but it does um, make the fruit so you don't not want to eat it. I don't know about wildlife. I don't know if wildlife would, would still go after it. Don't know. But um, it's, you know, it's, it's not horrible. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't, like I said, it didn't hurt the, my foliage and it, it just made the fruit look kind of, kind of weird. Yep, so. that's exactly it. So this is your last slide. Is that not correct? I don't want to turn this off. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the, the slides and uh, see if we can answer a couple questions in the last couple of minutes that we have uh, for it. Oh, good. Now I can see uh, some of the questions and stuff. Uh, but I think we've been answering some of them all along. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking to see if there's any that are popping out that we could, but please do realize everyone that's attending, I thank you for your attendance, but all the questions and the answers to the questions will be posted to the Smithsonian Gardens website next Wednesday, as well as a copy of the video so that everybody will be able to uh, um, see or or hear what we've been talking about for the full slides, because we did miss one or two slides at the very beginning of the um, uh, of the uh, presentation. But we'll they'll be able to see them and catch up with what we missed for the slides at the beginning of the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's okay. a question for you: That how do you define heavy clay? Because right. you've mentioned that several times, and I know we are just right. uh, full. Right. Of it. Well, I, I think the first thing is appearance. If you can, you can kind of look at it and see if it's very, almost like a, a very uniform, almost too uniform. If it's a good humus, good organic matter mixed in it, it should be a little bit variable in color, a little bit, in, and then when you grab a hunk of it in your hand, it should be uh, variable in texture. Uh, if you were to go ahead and squeeze it and then let your hand go, if it's still in, in the shape of your hand, but kind of like, uh, like Play-Doh, that's probably pretty heavy clay. Uh, there's a lot of technical things you could do, like obviously you could send it on to your extension service. They can do how much organic matter is in it, all of the pH and all that stuff. And then you can even test how much clay is in your soil. But if you do, just stick your hand in there and just play around with it a little bit, you'll feel if it's, you know, clay or not. Absolutely. That's terrific. So, Mm -hmm. Well, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to reiterate to people that you gave some wonderful selections, uh, but you also gave me some resources that uh, our attendees can uh, look to for answers and for uh, suggestions on different shrubs. And they're at the very top of the chat box. So if all the attendees and will, uh, participants will scroll up to the top of the chat box, you'll see some of the uh, resources that you shared with us. We'll also share it again on our website. And someone asked, uh, is it just going to appear next week and only next week? No, it's going to live. All these videos that we are creating will live on our website uh, in, in for the near future because this is a great resource um, uh, to be able to uh, share with our, our viewers for quite a long time. Uh, I also, somebody just asked, and boy, I know this question because I've worked with Alex for years. How do you choose a healthy plant at a garden center? And I know you have the answer to that one, mm -hmm. uh, just from right. your background. Well, I would say just, just looking at it. How does it look? Does it speak to you? I mean, is it a nice shape? I mean, if you're looking at a, a big green shrub, let's just use that as a generic term, and half of the leaves are gone and it looks kind of weird, or you shake it and it should be fully leafed out by now. It's not supposed to defoliate yet. Obviously, if it's fall, it might be different, but Obviously, that's the, probably the first thing. Also, uh, I don't know how the rest of the garden center world feels about this. I don't have a problem when I worked at a garden center. Grab it, take it out of the pot. 
<laughs> take it out of the pot and don't let them the see you. <laughs> take, yeah, to take a look at the roots because if the roots go all the way around, right, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be um, pretty well rooted out all the way to the edge of the pot, not root bound. But if you pull that thing out and only half the soil comes out and there's more soil on the bottom, you got root rot in there, right? If the roots don't go all the way around to the outside, something's wrong there too, okay? So, um, yeah, so that's, it, is it healthy, okay? And obviously, if you see something wrong, like uh, the disease or an insect on the foliage or something, that, that's probably obvious. But I would take a look at the roots. I would take a look at the general shape, um, for sure. And also mm -hmm. talk to the staff. If you get a bad feeling, I just, I just leave and go somewhere else. <laughs> okay. So. We're gonna, we have time for one person that has their hand raised. So I'm going to play the lottery system and just pick one. And I'm going to allow Rebecca to talk. Rebecca, please go ahead and ask your question to Alex. My, hey. question, my question is about the um, Ilex verticillata. I find that the deer devour every shoot on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I right. wondered what you thought about that. Right. Um, but what Cindy said is correct. The hollies are toxic, uh, particularly the berry. But, but, I, but I think the important thing is that the, the stems, as the stem gets more mature, it starts to develop a lot of that toxicity, if you will. When the stem is just, let's say, first coming out and it's still juvenile, it probably doesn't have those qualities yet in the in the bark. So when the deer comes, they'll probably go go to town on it, which is unfortunate because then you're going to ask, well, how's it I, how's it ever going to grow if it can never, <laughs> if it can never get anything bigger, you know? So uh, maybe you can net it like the first two years or, or something like that. Let the size of the cane get a little bit more pronounced, um, get it get some height on it, you know, that kind of thing. So maybe in the beginning, maybe maybe you have to spray it the first two years or something. But try that. So I think that's what's going on there. But for the most part, mm, I've got pretty good success with that. So, um, and of course, deer are just like any other living creature. They have likes and dislikes, maybe in different parts of the United States, in different neighborhoods kind of thing. So. That's, that's great yeah. advice. I always found too that if you uh, know that you have a problem with deer in your area, if at all possible, the best uh, way to be able to deter them from eating your favorite native plants, because they've grown up around these plants, they've developed a taste for them, but is to plant to, to uh, place a fence around the yard that you want to grow your native plants in, and then plant the plants. Because once they've found that you have some yummies in your yard, they're gonna they're gonna try to get in no matter what. For sure. But, Alex, I thank you so much for these wonderful, wonderful plants that we can put in our garden, uh, native plants. I agree, it's, it's what our insects and what our wildlife uh, recognize. And so to have them in our gardens, it's so beneficial. And it helps, it, we don't, unlike some people, I, I don't believe that we have to have entire native plants because there are so many great plants out there, but they sure do help uh, our, our wildlife in their habitats. So thank you for enlightening on us. And again, this webinar will be showed, this video will be re-shown next week and live on our, our, our webinar, I mean, on our website next week for now and for as long as we feel that it's appropriate. So thank you so much for your help and thank you so much for your ideas. Thank you all thank you. for attending and we expect to see you next week. Uh, we're gonna talk about summer herbs. Bye. Bye.